Okay. So this is the second chapter of extra credit work that is in the course. So this, um, this chapter counts just like any other chapter. It's just that you get extra credit for it. So it's actually pretty valuable. Um, we're going to talk about intermolecular forces today. And then the next topic, the next time I go over this, I'll talk about um, heat of vaporization, phase changes, we call them. Okay. So we'll cover uh, section 11.1 .1 today, which is intermolecular forces. And this is a topic related to a lot of the physical phenomena that we measure in chemistry. So you think back at the beginning, we measured the density of a liquid. We measured the density of water, right? And um, we measured, uh, you know, the, the enthalpy changes for certain chemical reactions. And um, the last experiment in the course is related to freezing point, the temperatures that things uh, freeze at. So what we want to do is we want to have a molecular explanation for some of the macroscopic behaviors of matter that we measure. So here's a list of some of the macroscopic, remember macro means big, properties of matter. So one would be density, right? The density of a material, okay? In terms of liquids, water is a relatively dense liquid. It has a density of one gram per milliliter approximately. Alcohols have lower densities, around 0.7 grams per milliliter. And other liquids like um, benzene or toluene or acetone or ether, those, those densities are even a little lower. So there's a relationship between density and the type of material that you're looking at. Um, another one would be what we would call boiling point, and that's an important one for this topic. Right, so if you recall, okay, well, density is mass over volume, right? The boiling point is the temperature at which something begins to boil, begins to undergo a rapid phase change, right? Phase change is going from liquid to gas. So for example, this water, some of it's evaporating right now. So if I were to leave this out over time, the level would probably go down. But then there's also water in the air and some of that water would condense back in. So it may not go down all that much. If I were to take a fan and put the fan next to it and blow, what we would find is the water level would go down more rapidly. And that's essentially because some of the molecules are going into the gas phase. So they're gas now. And the, the air that we're blowing with the fan would just blow them away. So it, they wouldn't have an opportunity to come back down into the liquid phase. And so the level might go down a little bit. But if we raise the temperature to some point, which we call the boiling point, what you'll see is bubbles will start to form. You'll get what we call convection cells and it will very rapidly move into the gas phase irreversibly. It doesn't come back, it just goes away and boils off, okay? If we cover it, then what will happen is a lot of it will go into the gas phase and we'll have a mixture of a lot of gas, water vapor, and then we'll have the liquid down here level below it, okay? So boiling point is the temperature at which something boils. It is dependent on the atmospheric pressure the higher the atmospheric pressure is, the higher the boiling point is. So what happens is if you're looking at boiling something at high altitude where the atmospheric pressure is lower, it will boil at a lower temperature. We normally think of water as boiling at 100 degrees Celsius, but that's technically only at sea level because atmospheric pressure is 1 atm. If we move up to an altitude where the atmospheric pressure is lower, it will boil at a lower temperature. And so that's why the instructions, if you ever read some of these boxes, they'll tell you that if you're at high altitude, you should boil it a little bit longer if you want to loosen it up, if you want to make it softer because it's boiling at a lower temperature. So it's not as, as hot when it actually boils, okay? So you got your boiling point. Um, another one is melting point, which sometimes we call freezing point. <laughs> It's the same temperature, right? It's just what direction you're going. So if you're 
taking a solid and you're melting it into a liquid, we call it the melting point. That's the temperature at which it melts. But that's the same temperature that it freezes at. If you take the liquid, it should freeze at the same temperature. So it's also called the freezing point. Okay. There's another one called viscosity. And I won't get real technical about it, but the viscosity is essentially how much resistance the fluid has to moving. So essentially, if you're pouring this liquid, how easily does it pour? Water is actually considered a relatively viscous liquid. It actually flows relatively slowly. If you take some of the other liquids like benzene, it will flow more readily. And so that's called viscosity. So those are just a few. These are macroscopic properties, right? These are things we don't have to have some little atomic force microscope to measure. We use something big like a thermometer or a balance or a graduated cylinder to measure volume. We don't need to measure it at the atomic level. We measure it at the macroscopic level, a bulk property of these materials, okay? In fact, these are what we would call bulk properties. They don't really have much meaning at the atomic level. Now what we're gonna do is we're, we're gonna try to kind of explain a little bit about these properties, how they're related to something called intermolecular forces. And intermolecular forces means forces between different molecules. The inter means different, molecular means molecules, forces means you know forces of attraction or repulsion. In particular, we're talking about forces of attraction. The intermolecular forces that we'll talk about are all attractive forces, okay? So the idea is, imagine you've got a molecule. So I'll use water, for example, and I'll just put a little circle around it just to say that's what it looks like. And you have another water molecule. What we're gonna look at is, is the claim is that they, these two molecules are attracted to each other. We're not gonna do force calculations. We're not gonna calculate the actual force in Newtons not even the energy in joules. We're just gonna talk about them sort of qualitatively. What types of forces do these molecules have? So these attractive forces are called intermolecular forces. So I'll just abbreviate it IMF for short, okay? Um, that would be intermolecular forces. Now. What about intramolecular forces? That would be the sort of converse of that, the reverse of it. An intramolecular force would be the force between atoms in the same molecule. So for example, we know that in a water molecule, the hydrogen atom is attracted to the oxygen atom. Let's make this oxygen bigger, I'm sorry. they're attracted to each other as well, right? We call those covalent bonds, right? Those are called covalent bonds. Those are attractive forces. And those covalent bonds are what are called intramolecular forces. Okay, intra. We talked about intramolecular forces in chapter six, when we talked about the attraction for the nucleus to the um, electrons, we talked about it in chapter eight and we talked about it in chapter nine. We're not gonna talk about that here. We're gonna talk about intermolecular forces, which are the forces between different molecules, this one to this one, okay? And in general, just in its most general way or general form, there are three types of intermolecular forces we wanna be aware of. Actually, I take that back, there's four. These are categories, right? The first of which you're very familiar with, and these are called ionic. And ionic forces tend to be very strong. So what do I mean by that? Take the substance NaCl, for example, sodium chloride, which is a solid at room temperature. The melting point is 801 degrees C, 
and the uh, vaporization point, that's the temperature at which it, it boils, the boiling point. Okay, I'll put a B for boiling. That is at 1465 degrees C, very, very high temperatures. And what we'll see is that the temperatures that substances melt and boil at is related to the intermolecular forces. So what does that mean? Well, think about it. It's an ionic substance, right? So when you look at ionic compounds, they don't generally exist as individual molecules, right? They exist as salts, you know, as ionic compounds. <laughs> My atoms here kept getting smaller and smaller, so sorry. There we go. So it turns out the sodium ion is smaller than the chloride ion. So I've only drawn one row, but think about a little grain of salt, right? A grain of salt is, you know, trillions or actually more than trillions of these little molecules all linked together like a building, right? So sodium chloride is a bunch of molecules. It's a big, gigantic cluster of molecules, okay? So what we would claim is that this sodium chloride molecule here, if it were a molecule, if you were able to remove it, it would be very strongly attracted to this molecule right here. Enormous attractions because the sodium ions are positively charged, the chloride ions are negatively charged. So if I remove this molecule, you're removing a negative charge, which is right in contact with a positive charge. That is a very difficult thing to do, right? Now, it turns out water can dissolve it, so water is able to do it. That's impressive. But actually to remove these is kind of what you're doing when you melt it. You're kind of making them able to move away from each other. Look at the temperature at which that happens. Compare that to water, 100 degrees C, right? Or ethyl alcohol, 78 degrees C, or methanol, 68 degrees C, right? So these temperature are 86 degrees. These temperatures are very large for the ionic compounds. So what we would claim is that the ionic substances have very strong intermolecular attractions or intermolecular forces because really what you're looking at are the attractions of ions for each other. And attractions of ions are very strong if they're close to each other. Remember you have, there's a energy is minus K Q1 Q2 over R. Forget about the negative and the K for now. The point is this is the charge of each particle. And this is the distance between the particles. So what happens is the distance is pretty small. These are right next to each other. So if you make a really small number down here, this is going to be pretty large here. So ionic substances have very strong intermolecular forces. How do you recognize an ionic substance? Very simple. You just look and see, does it have a metal and a nonmetal? A metal with a nonmetal is generally an ionic compound. And there you go. You got that one. So that's one type. The second type are what are called dispersion forces. Let me spell it very carefully so you have the word dispersion. Okay. Sometimes they're referred to as London dispersion. Sometimes they're called van der Waal forces. So you may see those terms out there. They're essentially talking about the same thing. So some textbooks will call these London dispersion forces. Other textbooks will just call them dispersion forces. So these are the attractions of molecules or atoms toward each other. due to random electronic fluctuations. Okay. So the idea is that if you have an atom, like a helium atom, 
and there's your 1s orbital, right? Helium is 1s2, right? That's the electron configuration. And you have another helium atom, and that has two electrons, 1s2. Again, intermolecular forces are the forces between the different molecules. Now, obviously, helium is not a molecule, it's an atom, but we use that term in this context, molecular. We could call them interatomic forces, but then we'd have a different name for the same thing. What we're going to claim is that these are just attracted to each other due to fluctuations of the electrons. I'm not going to go into detail about it. It's a kind of a quantum mechanical phenomenon, but there are attractions between them. In general, these types of attractions scale up, become stronger, the more electrons the substance has. So it as the number of electrons the substance has increases, the stronger these forces become. So for example, if we were to compare two helium atoms to two neon atoms, So I've written up above the electron configurations of those neon atoms, right? Neon is element 10, has 10 electrons, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. What we would claim is that these attractions are going to be stronger because it has more electrons. So this would be stronger, and this one would be weaker. I know I drew the neon atoms further apart from each other, but the attractive forces are stronger, OK? So those are called dispersion forces, and they also work for molecules. So if you have a molecule that has a lot of atoms in it, that means there's more electrons. It's going to have stronger dispersion forces. If it only has a few atoms of the same element, right, then it's going to have weaker um, dispersion forces. And for us, the main, the main measure of the strength of these forces is boiling point. What we find is that the stronger the attractive forces are, the higher the boiling point is. So I'll talk about that as soon as I get through all four of these. Okay. So that's the first two, ionic and dispersion forces. How do you recognize ionic? Metal with a nonmetal, sodium chloride, lithium iodide. How do, you how do you recognize dispersion forces? Well, if it's between atoms, it would be dispersion. And it, so it's, you know, atoms, attraction. So for example, neon or helium. The other category is nonpolar molecules. So for example, CH4, which is a tetrahedral arrangement of carbon and hydrogen atom, they will also have dispersion forces, okay? So let's go through and let's look at the third one. So number three, so we've done ionic dispersion. The third one is called dipole-dipole. Okay, so this is getting back to that discussion in chapter seven, I'm sorry, chapter eight and chapter, chapter nine. We talked about electronegativity differences and how that led to polar or nonpolar bonds or dipoles. And then in chapter nine, we talked about um, polar molecules based on the electronegativity differences of the bonds and also the shapes of the molecules, right? So this is the third category, dipole, dipole. And this is essentially what we're claiming here is that polar molecules will attract each other. Okay, polar molecules will attract each other. Simple as that. Okay, so if I have something like HCl, let's go back to our electronegativity value. This is back from chapter eight, right? Hydrogen has an electronegativity of 
chlorine has an electronegativity of 3.0. Remember that second row started at lithium 1.0, beryllium 1.5, boron 2.0, all the way through fluorine, which was 4.0. Chlorine is 3.0. So there's a difference, right? There's a difference between those electronegativities. I'm using delta for difference. Polar, right? Polar molecule. So essentially what we would claim is that this is what essentially happens. The hydro hydrogen chloride molecule, they will be attracted to each other through intermolecular forces. Now notice what I'm doing. I'm showing the forces there as these little dots. Why the particular orientation? Because remember what we said, we said that when you draw the vector representing the dipole, the positive end is on the less electronegative atom or sometimes called electropositive atom. The negative end is the head of the arrow and that's on the more electronegative atom, which in this case is the chlorine. So the chlorine has a negative charge. So it's attracted to the positive charge of the hydrogen atom. So those are called, this one has a dipole, this one has a dipole, so they call them dipole-dipole interactions. And so what you'll end up with is that in a molecule, in a substance, you'll have a bunch of these attractions occurring. And they will orient themselves in such a way as to maximize the attractions and minimize the repulsions. So see how I'm drawing this? I'm drawing in a bunch of them. That's essentially what happens at the molecular level. We now have kind of a molecular explanation for how molecules are interacting with each other. So notice hydrogen to chlorine, hydrogen to chlorine, never chlorine to chlorine or hydrogen to hydrogen because the less electronegative atom, hydrogen, is gonna be attracted to the more electronegative atom, chlorine and vice versa. They're attracted to each other, right? So what you end up with are these clusters, these clusters of molecules that are, it's not such a strong bond that they stay together. It's not rigid. They break off and they come back. They break off. They're rotating. They're vibrating. They're all moving around at all times. But on average, there's all these attractions occurring. Okay. So these are called dipole-dipole forces, dipole-dipole attractions, you know, but the point is dipole, dipole, okay? Polar molecules, that's the key. The molecules have to be polar for these forces to exist. Now let's go back to ionic. Is it gonna be ionic? No, there wouldn't be ionic attractions here because this is not an ionic substance, it's molecular. You've got a non-metal with a non-metal. That's not ionic, that's molecular. So there's not gonna be ionic interactions here. Is there gonna be dispersion? Well, what we said was if there, we said that dispersion forces were a result of the attraction of electrons, you know, the random fluctuations that lead to net attractions. It has electrons. So yes, there's also going to be dispersion forces here too. Um, but in general, for if you have dipole-dipole interactions, they very often will dominate over the dispersion forces. There's such strong interactions that they're stronger than the, than the dispersion. But this one would also have dispersion forces, okay? The fourth one is a very special form or is a special form, a category of dipole-dipole interactions. That's called hydrogen bonding. So those of you that have taken biology, you know about hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonding occurs when you have very large electronegativity difference where one of the atoms is hydrogen. So HF, right? The electronegativity difference there is huge, 4.0, 2.1. So your difference is four minus 2.1, 1.9. So just like with, with HCl, you end up with a polar molecule, a polar bond. But it's really polar, right? Because that difference is huge, 1.9. It's almost ionic. 
So um, we call it hydrogen bonding, having to do with the fact that, that relative to the other nonmetals like fluorine or nitrogen or oxygen, hydrogen has a very low electronegativity, 2.1. But furthermore, it's a very small atom. It only has one proton and one electron. So what happens is when you bond it to a highly electronegative atom, the hydrogen atom becomes very largely positively charged. And that leads to very strong attractions between molecules. So we see hydrogen bonding when the hydrogen is bonded either to a fluorine which really only happens with HF, to an oxygen that can happen in all sorts of molecules like alcohols, sugars, or to nitrogen. So if you look at the molecule, the molecular structure, and you find that there's a hydrogen atom bonded to one of these three atoms, you can then claim that this molecule will exhibit hydrogen bonding. We can do it between the same molecules, but we can also do it between different molecules. So for example, water and alcohols are attracted to each other. Why? Both of them have an OH. So if they both have an OH, they're going to attract each other via hydrogen bonding, okay? Ammonia is very attracted to water. If you take ammonia cleaners, the ammonia that's dissolved in the water, good luck getting it out of the water. They're very strongly attracted to each other because they both exhibit hydrogen bonding. So effectively what happens is, I'm gonna make a little box over here for the hydrogen bonding. If you take an ammonia molecule, boy, look at that. That was a bad one there. I'm trying to get a little bit of the shape here. Remember, you got your little lone pair there for ammonia. And then you take a water. Essentially, what will happen is the, the, the hydrogen atoms will point towards the nitrogen. And so you'll actually have attractions here, and you'll have attractions there. And then like another ammonia molecule, its hydrogens will line up with the oxygen. And so you got these attractions here. So obviously things like DNA and proteins and sugars and all of that stuff, they're all good at hydrogen bonding um, because they've all got these OH groups. They've all got these NH groups. Fluorine is not really an issue for the most part um, because there's only one type of hydrogen bonding with, a, with fluorine and that's HF. And that's an anti so dangerous acid. But, but with nitrogen and oxygen, you're gonna see this hydrogen bonding. So, you know, hydrogen bonding can be very, very strong. It can be essentially about 5% the strength of a covalent bond, you know, one out of 20, 5% is about one out of 20. So it's you know, not as strong, nowhere near as strong as a covalent bond. But if you have a bunch of them, it becomes additive. So that's why, you know, things like DNA are stable because you have so many of these hydrogen bonds between the nucleic acids or the bases. Okay. So those are our four categories. And um, we have dipole-dipole, we have hydrogen bonding, we have dispersion. And just as like with the dipole-dipole, dispersion forces exist pretty much always. So even if you have hydrogen bonding between ammonia and water, there's also dispersion forces occurring, but they generally will be much smaller than the um, hydrogen bonds, the strength will be much smaller than the strength of the hydrogen bonding that's taking place. There are other ways of classifying these. You can talk about ion dipole attractions or ion dispersion attractions and things like that. You can have other categories, but in general, these are the four main categories. The stronger the intermolecular forces, whichever ones we're talking about, whichever of these four, the higher the boiling point will be, the higher the melting point will be. So boiling point, very much boiling point, is related to the strength of the intermolecular forces. So you can kind of tell then by looking at boiling points how strong these intermolecular forces are. If you have a very high boiling point, that means the forces are very strong. If you have a very low boiling point, that means the forces are very weak. 
So let me show you an example. Um, yeah, helium. Liquid helium. Liquid helium, we actually have that in our third floor laboratory for the nuclear magnetic resonance instrument. It has a boiling point of four Kelvin, which is, you know, minus 269 degrees C, right? That's really cold. That's almost zero Kelvin, right? It's getting as close as you can. The reason for that is that, oops, is that if you consider it, you know, you take two helium atoms, how strong are the attractions? Well, this one only has two electrons. You can't get much fewer than two, right? Hydrogen has an even lower boiling point. I forget what it is, but it's even lower. It actually doesn't, it's, 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 it's hard to liquid, you have to pressurize it to liquefy it. Helium, um, very few electrons. So the dispersion forces are very weak. It doesn't have a dipole because it's an atom, right? You have to have, a, you have, to have bonds and electronegativity difference to have a dipole. So there's no dipoles. And obviously it's not um, oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine. So there's no hydrogen bonding. So the only thing you have are very weak dispersion forces. So it boils at a very low temperature, okay? Now consider something like sodium chloride, which is a solid at room temperature, right? Well, this is ionic, right? You got you know the plus minus, plus minus, plus minus. Lots of interactions occurring. They're very strong ionic. So its boiling point is 1465 degrees C. Then you consider water. Well, water, okay, well, what's the boiling point of water? 100 degrees C. So that's not real high compared to um, sodium chloride, but that's 373 Kelvin, right? 373 is a lot larger, a lot greater than negative 269. That's a huge difference, right? So these must be much stronger intermolecular forces than you have with the helium atoms. And that's true. Why? Well, we do have some dispersion forces because you got you know, hydrogen and oxygen, but you also have hydrogen bonding. This is the main factor, right? Because you have hydrogen bonding, those molecules are very strongly attracted to each other. So it's gonna boil at a very high temperature. Okay, so it's at this stage that I want to look at a couple of Alex problems. So let me bring these up. Okay, the first one is trying to get at a visual representation of intermolecular for of, actually let me rephrase that a visual representation of electrostatic charge of electrical charge within a molecule or an atom. So what they do is they give you four different substances. And these are called electrostatic potential maps. And then they want you to rank one, two, three, five, you know, highest, lowest, in between one, two, three, four, the strength of the intermolecular forces that take place. Okay. So the first thing, let's take a look at the coding here. What it says here is that if it's blue, that means it has a positive charge. So there's no blue in here. If it's red, that means it has a negative charge. There's no red in here. And if it's white, that means that it's neutral. It's not positive or negative. So as you look at this, see, it's all pretty much white. I mean, obviously, it's a little darker on the edges just to shade it so that you can see it. But it's pretty white. There's no red. There's no, no blue. So there's really no positive or negative charge. So that would be, you know, something where the atoms, it's two atoms there, right? You can most likely two atoms, where the two atoms have the same electronegativity values. So hydrogen with a hydrogen or a oxygen with an oxygen or a nitrogen with a nitrogen. So homonuclear diatomic molecule, presumably, 
Well, if it's neutral like that, you, it, it doesn't have any dipole, right? Right. It's, it's, you know, if it, there's no positive or negative, there's no dipole. If there was a dipole, you'd see some red for negative and blue for positive. So it's nonpolar. So the only force that's around when it's nonpolar, that was the dispersion forces, right? And that depends on how many electrons you have. Now let's take a look at the second one. The second one, that's only one atom. If it's only one atom, it's just dispersion forces. So we have two here that are dispersion forces. And again, you can see there's no blue or red. So it's completely neutral because it's an atom. So these will be kind of weak, right? Weak attractions just because of dispersion forces. But this one should be stronger intermolecular forces than B because there's two atoms. So you have twice as many electrons. Twice as many electrons should be more dispersion forces, stronger dispersion forces. Remember we said for dispersion forces, the more electrons you have, the stronger the forces. So, so A would outrank B. A would be stronger than B. Then we come down to the third one. The third one has some neg. Okay, now we have a central atom with three surrounding atoms, but it looks like these two atoms are different than this one here. So this really could be like a carbon with an oxygen and then two hydrogens here. They're showing all the atoms as being the same size, but COH2, for example, which is called formaldehyde and formaldehyde is actually a pretty polar molecule. Oxygen more electronegative than carbon, but carbon's more electronegative than hydrogen. So you don't need to know which atoms these are. I said COH2 just as a guess, but it doesn't matter. They're giving you the negative charge. They're giving you the positive. So you've got negative here, positive down there. That's a dipole. So now you've got your dipole-dipole interactions, right? We don't know whether it's hydrogen bonding. I mean, you know, it's, I guess it's possible this is a nitrogen and that's a hydrogen, but we don't need to know that. We just know that it's going to be polar. So we're going to have some pretty strong intermolecular forces. Now, this last one's a little tricky. Positive in the center, negative all around here. But what you have to do with this one is you have to consider what we call symmetry. We talked about that in section 9.2 when we talked about the polarity of molecules. So some molecules might have electronegative differences within the molecule, the polar bonds. But if the polarity dipole moments cancel each other, overall it's nonpolar. Okay, so that's what's happening here. You've got a dipole this way, you've got a dipole that way, you've got a dipole that way. They're canceling each other. So overall the molecule is nonpolar. So now let's go through the rankings. This would be the highest intermolecular forces, the strongest intermolecular force because it's the most polar. Then we've got one that's less polar. In fact, probably nonpolar because of the symmetry of the molecule. So this one's going to be weaker. This one's not going to have any dipole moments at all. So it's nonpolar. So that'll be even weaker. And then this one has fewer electrons than this one does. So this is going to be the weakest. So it looks like the strongest is this one with the permanent dipole. This would probably be the second strongest because it has dipole moments and lots of electrons, so strong dispersion forces. This one right here would be much lower because it's just dispersion forces and there's only two atoms. And then this one would be only one atom, so it would have the weakest. Now, we don't know that for a fact, but these atoms in the center may be the same atoms that are in there. So we'll assume that that's the case. Okay. So that's kind of a fun one to look at that. Can you clarify again real quick what, again, is, is the difference between dispersion and dipole and how do we figure that out? The way you figure it out is very simple. If it has a difference in electronegativity, it has a dipole. If it has no difference in electronegativity, then it's dispersion. Okay. Let's take a look at a hydrogen bonding problem. Identifying hydrogen bonding interactions between molecules. Okay, so now we're looking specifically for hydrogen bonding, right? So the molecule has to have either fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen 
covalently bonded to a hydrogen. That makes it capable of hydrogen bonding, okay? So let's take a look at this one. So methanol. So here's methanol, right? CH3OH, right? Notice the two lone pairs on the oxygen. So there's an oxygen to hydrogen. Well, there you go. Right there, that tells you that this molecule is capable of hydrogen bonding, okay? So yes, there will be hydrogen bonding between this molecule and uh, between molecules of this, between different molecules of this compound. And can it do it with water? Well, yeah, right. So if this can form hydrogen bonds with another molecule of methanol, it can also form hydrogen bonds with water because water is capable of hydrogen bonding. So if this is yes, that one's gotta be a yes. Chloromethane, now look at this one, chloromethane. Now I'm not gonna draw the Lewis structure, but it's got a central carbon with three surrounding hydrogens and one surrounding chlorine. That's nice. Some people actually debate a little bit about chlorine because the chlorine has a very high electronegativity. It's about the same as um, nitrogen, but it's a bigger atom. And under you know, most agreements, it doesn't count as hydrogen bonding. It's very close. It, they are strong dipole-dipole interactions, but it doesn't count. So since chlorine is not fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen, it is incapable of doing the hydrogen bonding. But there's another reason here too, which is the hydrogens are not bonded to any of those elements. They're bonded to the carbon. So a hydrogen bonded to carbon is not capable of hydrogen bonding. The hydrogen has to be bonded to fluorine, nitrogen, or oxygen. So, so be careful. You know, you say, oh, there's an oxygen in the molecule. Oh, there's a hydrogen molecule, so it must have hydrogen bonding. No, the hydrogen in the molecule must be bonded to one of those three elements. If it's not, if it's attached to carbon or phosphorus, no good. It's not hydrogen bonding. So no, no. And chloroethylamine. The amine part is where when I read the name, I'm thinking amine. Amine is NH2. Ammonia is NH3. So if it has NH2, that's probably going to be hydrogen bonding, right? So carbon to hydrogen, no, that's not hydrogen bonding, not capable. Nitrogen to hydrogen, there you go. Nitrogen to hydrogen, that's going to be capable of hydrogen bonding. So yes, if you had two of these molecules, you could have hydrogen bonding between the two molecules. This nitrogen would be attracted to the hydrogen in the other molecule, and this hydrogen would be attracted to the nitrogen in the other molecule, so yes. And again, yes, with water, it would be capable of doing that, okay? Okay, identifying the intermolecular forces between atoms, ions, and molecules, right? So ions, ionic, molecules, could be dipole, could be dispersion, could be hydrogen bonding, even if it has the correct atoms. And then atoms are really only capable of dispersion forces. So what kind of intermolecular forces would occur between a neon atom? So the key here is you got an atom and a carbon tetrachloride molecule, okay? If it's an atom, it's not capable of hydrogen bonding. It's not capable of ionic. To be ionic, it has to be an ion, right? And it's not capable of dipole-dipole interactions because it's just got an atom, so that's just dispersion. So the attraction between neon and tetra carbon tetrachloride, that would just be dispersion forces. That would be the only one possible. Okay, if, if either of them is an atom, it's just dispersion. If both are nonpolar, it's dispersion. If one is polar and the other one's nonpolar, it's dispersion. They have to both be polar for it to be dipole-dipole. Okay, same thing here. You've got a nitrogen molecule that's nonpolar, right? A nitrogen molecule is nonpolar because the two nitrogen atoms have the same electronegativity difference. So it's only capable of dispersion forces. Krypton, that's an atom, only capable of dispersion forces. So that one would just be dispersion forces. 
Okay, now let's take a look at this one. Here, we have a chlorine monofluoride, CLF, and hydrogen chloride, HCl. So CLF and HCl. Let's take a look at that one. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start by drawing the Lewis structures. Haha, <laughs> great news. Okay, so there's your two. Are they polar? 3.0, 4.0, that's pretty polar. 2.1, 3.0, oh, that's pretty polar. Both of them have dipole moments. Dipole, dipole. So that would be one of the interactions. The other one would be dispersion. Again, everything has dispersion forces. So you in this, in this particular one, you would have two. So you would separate them by a comma, okay? All right, that's a good one. I like that one. Let's take a look. Identifying the important intermolecular forces in pure compounds. This is kind of similar to what we just did a little bit. Decide which intermolecular forces act between the molecules of each compound in the table below. Compounds, so they give you four different compounds. So here is, it's just a different way of asking a similar question, right? So the idea here is that you would have a bunch of these formaldehyde molecules, like liquid, right? It's like a whole liquid. All those molecules are bouncing around. How are they attracting each other? So formaldehyde, well, that's a little tricky. You got a hydrogen in there and you got an oxygen in there. So we have to decide whether it's got hydrogen bonding, right? But formaldehyde, the carbon is the central atom. This was one of the molecules that was in the chemical bonding experiment, the next to last Next to last, yeah, the next to last experiment um, before freezing point depression. So formaldehyde is that trigonal planar carbon to oxygen with two hydrogens. It's, you know, 120 degrees. It's a polar molecule because carbon is bonded to the oxygen. Carbon to oxygen, carbon is 2.5 electronegativity, oxygen is 3.5, so it's polar. So it's definitely capable of dispersion. Everything that has electrons can do dispersion. It can also do dipole. Can it do hydrogen bonding? And so let's be careful about that. Can it do hydrogen bonding? I want to point out why it cannot. So here's the Lewis structure for the, for, it's actually, you know, the Lewis structure with the shape. Okay. There's a dipole, right? There's a dipole through there because of that electronegativity difference. But for hydrogen bonding, the hydrogen has to be attached to either fluorine or oxygen or nitrogen. So this is not, the hydrogens are attached to carbon. So this is not hydrogen, is not capable of hydrogen bonding, okay? That's the main point there. So for that first one, no hydrogen bonding, just dipole, dipole and dispersion. Second one, two atoms the same, right? Nonpolar, right? Electronegativities are the same. So just dispersion. Oxygen difluoride. Now that's an interesting OF2. I'll come back to that. No, actually, I'll go ahead. So OF2 and then carbon tetrachloride CCL4. So I'll do those at the same time. OF2. So OF2 is an interesting molecule. I, I have to kind of find out who uses it if it really has any practical uses. So there's your oxygen difluoride carbon tetrachloride CCL4. So here, what you get, based on your geometric analysis, is a bent arrangement. But instead of having hydrogens on the oxygen, you have fluorines. So what's interesting is that fluorine is more electronegative. So you get a dipole that goes this way, 
and then you get a dipole that goes this way. This is all chapter 9.2. So if you're having problems with these dipoles, go back to 9.2, watch the video on that, okay? So if you add those two together, you get a net dipole this way. So it's gonna be polar. So you're gonna have dipole, dipole interactions or just dipole interactions for sure, okay? So that one would have dispersion and dipole. The CCL4, this is where all this kind of comes into like play, right? All the stuff we talked about. Here's your tetrahedral and 109.5. And what we said was that's going to be nonpolar because the dipoles are canceling each other. So overall, it's nonpolar. So if it's nonpolar, you can't have dipole interactions. Of course, you can't have hydrogen bonding. There's no hydrogen in there to do that. So it's just dispersion. So the, the main thing is dispersion for nonpolar, dipole for polar, and then hydrogen bonding if you got you know, the very specific hydrogen bonded to either oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine. Okay. That's pretty good. Um, just about out of time. Let me see if I can do one more. Okay. This one, I wanna, I wanna go over this one because it's an interesting one. This one gets at the heart of the matter of experiment. So all those other ones we did, predicting, predicting. Well, how do you know that's true? we use boiling point as our real experimental test. The higher the boiling point, the stronger the attractions. The lower the boiling point, the weaker the attractions, right? So if something boils at a high temperature, it's got strong attractions. If it boils at a low temperature, it's got weak attractions. So you're making comparisons here. So GEH4 versus CH4. Now, what's, what's the comparison here? Hydrogen is the same, four hydrogens. Germanium and carbon, that's the difference. So what's the difference between germanium and carbon? Well, germanium is in the same family as carbon. It goes carbon, silicon, germanium. So they're in the same family, the same column. What happens as you move down the column? They get heavier. Sometimes people think inter, you know, the dispersion forces are based on mass, that they get heavier. That's not the point. It's not the weight. They still don't weigh very much. These the atoms are very light. It's that you're adding more electrons as you move down the table, right? Carbon has six electrons. Silicon has 14. Germanium has 32 electrons. So if you have 32 electrons, that's a lot of electrons. So that means that germanium hydride molecules, so this is called methane. I wonder what they would call that. Germany. Germane, Germane? I don't think it's called Germane. Um, GEH4 would have a lot of electrons. So strong dispersion forces, or stronger anyways, the dispersion forces would be stronger. Stronger forces mean higher boiling point. So in this case, GEH4 would have the higher boiling point. Take a look at this one. This one's got one carbon, another three carbons. Remember the parentheses, CH23? This is actually what we would call N pentane. We don't go over the naming of organic compounds in here much, but it's all the way back in chapter chapter one when you learn how to name compounds. This would be called N pentane. Five carbons, pent for five. Three carbons there, another four and five. So you got five carbons and a bunch of hydrogens. This one only has three carbons and a bunch of hydrogens, right? So more atoms, more electrons. So stronger molecular, intermolecular forces, so higher boiling point. N2 versus I2. Again, nonpolar molecules, homonuclear diatomics, like we talked about in um, molecular orbital discussions. Nitrogen is in group 5A. It has seven electrons, so that's a total of 14 electrons. Iodine is in group 7A. It's element number 53. So that's 106 electrons. 106 electrons, a lot of electrons. Iodine is actually a solid at room temperature because of the strength of these intermolecular forces. It actually is a solid, solid iodine. 
um, when you did the experiment where you were doing the bleach titration with iodide and it turned that purple and then clear, sometimes you got little crystals down at the bottom, solid iodide crystals. The intermolecular forces due to the dispersion forces are very strong because of the large number of electrons. So that one would have the higher boiling point, okay? Right, and is this related to like enthalpies and like heats of formation and stuff? The um, is that something that we can look up to kind of determine? Um, so I think we're going to talk in the next lecture about enthalpies of vaporization, and mm -hmm. so in a sense, yes, it is. It's related to the enthalpies of vaporization, which are the energies required to boil things. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it, it is related to that. That we'll get to that in the next topic. We won't have time for that today, but I guess I'll do that on um, Tuesday. Okay. Cool. All right. So the last one here in this section, which will really get you through a little over half of this assignment, right? So today I just covered essentially half of the assignment, a little bit more than half, really. Predicting the relative boiling points of pure substances. So really it's getting at the same thing. All these questions are kind of asking you the same thing. Now, again, boiling point, how strong are the attractions, right? So let's take a look and you're gonna rank these. You're just gonna like from highest to lowest. So this one, notice over here, chemists, what they will do is they'll look at a molecule. If it's a big molecule like this one, this is not a real big molecule, but it's bigger than you know H2O. What they do is they start instantly looking for groups around the carbons. Hydrogens, oh, nonpolar dispersion forces. Oh, there's an OH. That's hydrogen bonding, right? And then that's essentially what you do, like this one here. Oh, CH, that's nonpolar dispersion forces. CH, nonpolar dispersion forces. CO, oh, that's going that's polar. That's going to be dipole interactions. So that's how we kind of view these things. We start looking for different groups. Organic chemists will actually do it from a different perspective. They'll look for those groups, not to see whether they're polar or nonpolar. Well, I shouldn't say that. They're looking to see whether they're polar or nonpolar, but they're also looking to see how they're going to react. They'll say, oh, this carbon has an OH, so I can react that carbon in certain ways. Oh, this carbon is, you know, trigonal planar and it's got a very polar bond, so I can do chemical reaction on that part of the molecule. So, so really what you're doing is you're breaking down different parts. So Nonpolar dispersion forces, right? Oh, here we go. OH, there's your hydrogen bonding. That's going to have a very large boiling point relative to molecular substances. Okay. Second one, argon. Argon, just an element, a nonmetal element. That's a gas at room temperature. That's going to have a very low boiling point. It's going to boil at a very low temperature. This one, polar. So that's going to boil at a relatively high temperature, but not as high as this one probably, because hydrogen bonding generally is stronger in terms of intermolecular attractions than dipole moments are. So that's the reason that DNA uses hydrogen bonds. That gives the DNA molecule a lot of structure, even though it's not covalent, right? It's weak enough that you can take a protein and untwist the DNA molecule. You can break those hydrogen bonds. Covalent bonds are hard to break. It takes very strong enzymes to do that. But because they're hydrogen bonds, they're pretty strong. So it takes a real strong protein to do that. These dipole, DNA doesn't use dipole moments for the actual three-dimensional structure because they're not really strong enough. You know, they're strong, but they're not quite strong enough. And so this one's going to be weaker than this one. Now, this last one, be careful. This looks like an element too. So you're saying, wait a minute, argon and, ar and silver, those will be the same. But keep in mind, this is AG, that's silver. Silver is a metal, right? Metals have very high boiling points in general. So probably what you wanna do is, you know, put this one as the highest and then put the hydrogen bonding as the second highest and then put your dipole as the third highest and then put your dispersion as the fourth highest, okay? The only exception to the metal would be if it were mercury, Hg. Mercury is a liquid at room temperature, but even mercury, it's the only liquid metal 
at room temperature. Gallium is almost one, but mercury is the only one at room temperature. Mercury has stronger intermolecular forces than water does. So, um, so if it's a metal, it's going to be the strongest. So strongest would be the metal. Hydrogen bonding would be second. Um, dipole would be third. And then, you know, the weak um, intermolecular forces, dispersion forces would be the fourth. So this would be the weakest here. So boiling point, again, it goes in, in the opposite. The stronger the intermolecular forces, the higher the boiling point. So the silver would have the highest boiling point, but we know that silver is going to boil at high temperature. Um, and then this would be lower, this would be lower, and this would be the lowest. Okay. And there you go. So that is every one of the problems in that section. That's kind of cool. I didn't realize I'd be able to do that. I thought I'd only be able to do some of them, but that's all of them. So it looks like what we're left with now is the properties of liquids, which is 11.2. So on Tuesday, I will go over 11.2 and we're going to look at some physical properties. And then we're going to look at relating vapor pressure to vaporization. So that's getting at that issue of boiling vapor pressure. Um, I want to talk about that in a little bit of detail because we've covered it a little bit on a couple of the topics. We covered it a bit with the experimental experiment where we were measuring the molar volume of carbon dioxide and we had to take the vapor pressure of water into account. Um, and we talked about it a little bit here in terms of the boiling point. The boiling point is related to vaporization. So, so we'll come back and we'll talk about that in more detail on Tuesday. And then that will be it. We'll be we've run out of topics to talk about. Okay. So great luck with everybody. Um, and um, I'll see you, see you for the next one. Thanks so much. Have a good weekend.